Norman Jacko. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we're organizing this event from the unceded lands of the Kulin and nearby nations. Our speaker, Paul, is on Bunurong country. Chris, Howard and Richard are on Wurundjeri lands. Peter's on Bunurong land. And I'm on Wadawurrung country. Our computer expert, Alex, is on Jagara and Turbal lands in Brisbane. They've all cared for and managed these lands in a sustainable and re responsible manner for many tens of thousands of years. The initial settlers arrived, the common statement was that the land was like a gentleman's park and the soils so friable with good grasses and bulbs. We, re we need to respond to their welcome to country by also truly caring for this country. We have much to learn from them, not only on their land, farming and fire practices, but also their governance procedures, which led to no major wars across this continent for many tens of thousands of years. I offer my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to all of their mobs and to people from other mobs attending today, and also to all of you who've logged in from near and far away. Hi, I'm Rob Gardner and I help support these meetings with Chris, Rick, Howard and Peter. Today, particular thanks to Alex, who's managing all the activities in the background. Firstly, some housekeeping. Tonight's presentation and Q&A will be recorded and available to download in a few days time from the Renew website. If you have any technical problems or general comments, please use the chat button, bottom left. If you have any technical, if you have any questions, enter them on the right hand side on the Q&A button, button. Keep the questions fairly short if possible. We usually have a lot of questions, so we'll probably consolidate some and we may not be able to cover all of them. Some of you are new to Renew. Um, briefly, Renew was formed in 1980 to promote, to promote sustainability in all its forms. It is best known for its two magazines, Renew and Sanctuary, but also such events as Sustainable House Day in October with its various associated information sessions and Speed Date and Expert, which goes through the year and has been mostly virtual this year. Also electric vehicle fairs and many other fairs and events. However, it also has a significant research section and a lobbying group. Free modeling packages, Sunolator and Tankulator, and also an advisory service aimed not only at households, but offered to businesses and governments. Tonight, we are very fortunate, <coughs> fortunate to have Paul Blackman, the senior sales manager from Enviro Group, He's worked throughout this industry for the past 13 years and involved in a vast number of projects in both the residential and commercial area. He may be making a presentation on the ins and outs of battery installations and related issues. He'll probably answer some questions along the way, but then may answer a whole lot at the end after we've had a couple more sessions, brief sessions from two of our members on what they've done with their battery installations. This gives Paul a chance to put his young son to bed. So that's all the introduction. So I'll pass you straight over to Paul. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Rob. Can I just check then that everyone can hear me and um, see me and get a thumbs up? Yeah, we can see. You. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, okay, sharing the screen. Uh, how is that? Good. Uh, do you have my, uh, you don't have my question and answers one on it, do you? No. No. All right, great. Okay, well, thank you, Rob, and thank you for that very 
a heartfelt acknowledgement of country. Uh, that's, um, I think that was very well done. So thank you for that. And thank you for having me uh, present to the, um, the meeting today. I'm well aware of the status of the ATA and their very good work in a, in a uh, progressive sense for um, the solar industry uh, and all other um, alternative and or appropriate technologies across Australia. So I am um, very proud to be asked to come along for this. It'll um, hopefully be a informative session for you all. It won't be too technology heavy. You'll um, get the sense as I'm speaking that I'm reasonably pragmatic about uh, the products and the technologies available uh, in the solar and battery world. Um, you know, mainly they need to be available or um, more or less available anyway to, um, you know, to be meaningful to, uh, to talk about. So if there's a technology in a laboratory somewhere in the world that hasn't yet been scaled uh, to, um, to, um, to my mind, um, yeah, it's, it's a much less powerful uh, statement than, um, than talking about what there is available now uh, that people can do and get their hands on. So the title of the, um, the talk, uh, is it time to add batteries? Um, well, we don't know yet, uh, and it won't be for me to say. So that was the uh, title chosen uh, by I think Chris who helped arrange um, the session. Okie dokie. Um, as far as, um, um, hang on, I'm trying to get my page to go. Oh, there we go. Radio. I'll launch into it. So this is the uh, introduction to the um, presentation that got put out, out, out and about. So in case um, people haven't, haven't, uh, haven't seen that, um, it leads with, uh, so with a reduction uh, coming in the feed-in tariff and the uh, generous solar battery rebate, uh, storage batteries are becoming more common and with many different battery systems on the market, it could be time to consider including batteries in your solar installation uh, and a new one. And I will go into the ins and outs of installing batteries as part of a new system or in addition to an old one or an existing one. And of course, people can contribute however they like to the chat and ask any manner of questions that they like. I will cover or attempt to cover uh, various battery options, sizing, backup power, inverter and battery control selection, cost, size considerations, upgrading existing systems and future options and developments. And I promise that's the last time that I'll read out a whole entire slide in front of you. Is it time to answer batteries? Well, the upfront answer, short answer is, well, it's up to the consumer. What I can tell you is that from what we've seen at Enviro Group over the past five or six years, is that we're at a state now where batteries do work really, really well. They are very reliable. They don't seem to be out there breaking on mass at all. The feedback from our customers is that they're very happy, they're uh, satisfied with their reductions in power bills. Uh, for the most part, I guess, uh, they're very satisfied with the way that they work. Um, uh, as I said before, they're not breaking. So the battery technology itself seems to be reliable um, as we speak and uh, that's probably going to get better. So they are doing the job that uh, we promise and the job that the brochures promise as well. And they are working in principle the way that they're supposed to, which is giving nearly 100% of your daily power covered by solar and battery. So of course, solar does the daytime and maybe not of course, but then uh, batteries do the nighttime and that's, um, that's how uh, the whole system is generally arranged. And yes, it is uh, true that they're still considered to be reasonably expensive, although money is in the eye of the beholder, I dare say. 
but from my experience, uh, there are uh, there's a whole range of of customer pricing expectations uh, uh, from um, anyone thinking that they're more or less free uh, now um, to people, uh, uh, you know, thinking that they are going to be ten or twenty thousand dollars, and that that is reasonable, considering that throughout my time in the solar industry solar system pricing has come down from a street price of between 10 and 20,000 down to a street price of anywhere from almost nothing up to a few thousand dollars or more. Just a very small uh, amount about myself uh, and the business I represent at the moment in Viro Group. I would think that um, a good proportion of you watching the show tonight are aware that uh, our company owner, a chap called Mick Harris, um, is on the ATA board at the moment. And uh, as the story goes, I think helped found uh, the organisation uh, a couple of decades ago. He's probably watching from the sidelines tonight. He won't be speaking. And as a business, we have installed uh, many hundreds of solar battery systems around uh, the traps, starting off in the very early days um with your basic off-grid stuff you know sheds and lead acid batteries and all of that um and uh, our pinnacle probably is a 100 kilowatt system uh powering the uh, bushfire refuge in the city of nilbik at benigo bank stadium uh, for which we've won an award for so we cover the whole gamut we still do small systems and we can do big systems as well but well look we have been around now for long enough to see uh, some of our battery systems fail, right? To see some of the products fail. And so we know what we're talking about in that respect, how to get service, how to get things backed up. And um, yeah, we've seen a lot of systems that do continue to work as well um, for um, much longer than a decade. Um, that system there is uh, another one of our uh, Flagship systems, it's just a picture of a house there, but the next picture has a bit of equipment in it. Um, that represents how far we've come, right? So that's a 100% off-grid system uh, just north of uh, Lansfield or Kilmore, running 100% with no grid energy whatsoever and no generator either, which I think is really important. So back in the old days, a battery system would be a fairly dirty type of a manual thing where you might have to go out and uh, test the status of your batteries or get them maintained or, or baby the system through winter a lot. So this system here um, doesn't require that, right? It just keeps going and uh, we can monitor it remotely and the lovely customers, Jim and Sue, we haven't heard uh, a peep from them over this last winter, which has been a long winter too. You know, the weather hasn't been that good and the system has been running fantastically. So it is a... Um, a normal AC powered solar system. You can see the Fronius brand inverter to the left of the screen there. Um, they've got a, um, a heat pump hot water system there that should only use between one and two kilowatt hours a day. And then in, in the, uh, the shed, which is adjoining the property that you can't see, they've got a good old fashioned, uh, but fantastic Selectronic SP Pro inverter in that, running down to two LG batteries there on the ground and the whole thing is self-sufficient, which is fantastic. So one of the specifications of this uh, system was that they wanted to be able to drive up from uh, Melbourne uh, on the times that they're down here and with a remote control uh, using a Wi-Fi system, turn on their electric uh, heat pump um, uh, reverse cycle aircon system on a Friday afternoon and have that heat the house up by the time that they get there and have the solar and battery system kick in to make that run. And it works um, uh, really well to do that, which is great. Okay, battery storage, why you need it. Part one, well, graph number one. So this graph we've been carrying around for a number of years. It's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Your solar day in general uh, starts at 6 or 7 uh, a.m. in the morning and goes until 5 or 6 o'clock at night. And uh, a lot of that is over-generated during the day and has no real other place to go other than 
into the grid. And so uh, batteries come into place there where the battery can be uh, installed to catch, if you like, uh, for want of a better word, that excess, um, excess power, charge themselves up. And then by the time that the sun sets, you've got one battery load full of energy. You can, you can think of that like a water tank, if you like, a battery load full of energy ready to go to power the whole house over the evening. So the pinnacle design, I guess, is to power the whole home over the evening and the night time or every day of the year, including bad weather. But that is still a tall ask for many solar systems to get it to generate enough solar to then charge a battery to then run a house overnight in bad weather. The next graph is a slightly more modern graph, but I pinched that from one of the brochures um, of the products that we like a, a lot uh, called Redback Technologies. It's a, got a little bit more um, detail in there. Um, red bits uh, at the start being battery, uh, sorry, um, energy use from the grid, a little bit of a peak in the morning for toast and crumpets, and then a mixture during the day of self-consumed solar power in blue, battery charging in, um, in the middle of the day as well in green, uh, overproduction still of solar energy during the day that would go uh, back to the grid. And then later on in the evening, battery discharging into the house. And then uh, possibly at the end of that, a little bit of grid power at the end as well. Uh, like I said, though, the optimal uh, design would have uh, no uh, grid power being used at all. But look, it is a pragmatic way of designing things because um, your um, uh, peak power supply that might cost you a lot of money per kilowatt hour will end at uh, 11 o'clock at night. So one of the, 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 the points of the evening that you might want to stop uh, generating power for free uh, or running your house for free is 11 o'clock at night. And that would represent one of the, the more financially advantageous ways of designing a battery backup system. Battery storage, the basics, as I like to put it. So um, I think it's really important at the outset just to articulate that even though the talking topic is batteries and people are talking about batteries all of the time, the battery is not actually uh, the major part of the system uh, in my mind. It's a big part of the system but you've also got some inverter technology that you definitely need within that to at the very least get the DC um, power out of the battery and convert that to AC to run your house. That battery, sorry, that inverter will be either a separate thing or embedded within the battery technology itself. You need some sort of system monitoring that gets installed into the switchboard and you need some control of that as well and some visibility. So when you're buying a whole battery system, you are actually getting all of this stuff all joined together. And the software is incredibly important. Uh, the control of the system is incredibly important and the installation of that as well is incredibly important. Here's a, a picture of one of the uh, battery systems we installed a few years ago. That's a lovely chap called Nathan, who did all of that himself. And the brand of batteries and inverter we chose for that was Delta, uh, who have been around in the Australian market uh, for a decade or so. You can see up the uh, down the bottom here the two Delta batteries. One of the reasons that I like to show this picture is that it does fairly clearly show that the batteries are a very uh, um, a benign part of an installation. There's not um, there's not a lot of actual work that goes into plonking those batteries on the concrete ground there, but there's an awful lot of work that goes into wiring them up through into the switchboard. You can see the inverter there mounted at the top to the left. You can see one switchboard mounted up there to the right. You can see a monitoring box up there as well, an awful lot of switching that goes in there as well to disconnect and connect the batteries. There's AC and DC switches as well. And this doesn't even take into account the work that is internal into the switchboard that I don't have the photo of 
of this one. So yes, there's monitoring, lots of switchboard work, an inverter, uh, switches and isolators, and that's over and above um, just the, um, the two batteries there that are on the ground. AC systems versus DC systems. I think some people uh, with the knowledge base of VATA will understand this perfectly well, um, others won't. Um, this is a picture of how a DC style system is arranged where the inverter acts as though it's the, the hub of the system more or less. And you've got DC running into that inverter both from panels, solar panels and from the battery itself. And then the inverter is doing the management of, um, of a lot of that and the juggling of that and the redirection of the panels to the battery and from the battery back out of that again through the inverter into the home. All right, so that's a fairly common, um, you could call it a, a topology or an electrical uh, arrangement. Um, but that picture there uh, would be how a DC um, system looks. And that, that, that kind of replicates um, how some of the, the older style proper off-grid systems are if they're, if they're DC based. Whereas an AC system, so AC obviously is uh, alternating current. This is a, a picture borrowed from the, um, the Tesla uh, Powerwall uh, brochure. Most of the decision making is done in the switchboard here. There's a massive set of monitoring and control that is, um, or just monitoring rather, that's strapped in the switchboard. The connection of the power into the switchboard at every level is AC, and it's AC coming out of the battery and also going into the battery as well, and also out of the solar inverter as well. It has AC too, and off to the grid there um, to the right is also um, um, AC. So my mouse, just checking that, yeah, the mouse does work. Um, it's a bit slow though. Just trying to use that as a, as a pointer. Yeah, so out of the Tesla battery here, um, AC power comes out of that. And then built, a, built inside this inverter, although they don't really tell you too clearly, um, is a bit of um, DC to AC inverter technology that's uh, pretty snazzy as well but particularly the Tesla style product doesn't talk about that. How these systems work uh, in general, um, I'm going to more or less go through a bit of a list of suggested um, questions at this point um, that I saw um, coming through from, um, uh, from Chris uh, and, and, and people as they were uh, structuring this session. So, a greenfield system, in other words, starting from scratch and wondering whether they should just put a solar array in and if they should add a battery to the installation and what does the battery option mean for inverter uh, selection. So a greenfield system, um, installing solar now and a battery later. So one thing that I hope that I'll get across in this talk is that the inverter uh, itself, which, which can be a true battery ready solar hybrid inverter is, is, is in many ways not the main thing that needs to be considered, although it, although it can be. What will work uh, perfectly well is to install a normal solar PV system at the moment as it stands, that's option one there, without almost any consideration for the future. And then down the track, install an AC battery. There are numerous AC batteries on the market and they will connect into the home's uh, switchboard without any real need for them to connect in a direct way to the solar system. So the reason that that is my personal preference um, if you want to do just solar now and batteries later is that the, the common language between all of this stuff is a 230 volt uh, AC uh, power and that will always be around. So if there are significant technology changes, for example, in the next couple of years, 
um, uh, in the past, they have rendered so-called battery ready inverters uh, unusable or at least very impractical. And they've left a couple of customers disappointed. Whereas you can take a 10 year old solar system in principle, add an AC battery to that. And an AC battery, I'll just remind you there, is a completely encompassed um, battery system with an AC power output. And it'll have monitoring that it comes with that gets strapped around um, in the, um, the, the the switchboard. So that would be my personal preference there. Um, of course, option two, you can install a, a uh, solar PV system with a battery ready inverter. And a battery ready inverter will be a solar inverter with battery technology in it and with DC charging outputs and inputs uh, from that inverter into a battery that you can put there in the future. So the reason that that um, historically has been for some people problematic is that there's, well, for a start, only a limited selection of inverters available. And you might only find, for example, that an inverter manufacturer only makes one model, or maybe two that are battery ready whereas they've got dozens of models that are normal uh, uh, solar style inverters of a range of sizes that will suit you. There's plenty of bland, brands around for that available. There's plenty that come up online when you have a look at it. Um, there'll be a limited selection though of batteries that are available that will suit a particular inverter. And then I think is the, the um, sticking point that um, a lot of people will find um, hard to stomach. So if you bought uh, the brand Redback uh, inverter, for example, that Enviro Group uh, proudly sell, but, but so do many others. At the moment, the Redback battery system is only designed for one brand of battery only, and that's the brand Pilantec out of, um, out of China. Now, if you, for whatever reason, decided you wanted to use BYD, batteries or an LG battery or a Tesla battery or some other brand that you felt that was your choice, it just is not going to work with the Redback. And it's not to do with electricity per se, it's to do with the communications, it's to do with the fact that the products are usually designed um, hand in hand and that the communi communications protocols are there in place to make those two products work um, together. If you bought the Fronius uh, new range of, of product that they've got out that we actually haven't sold uh, many of, it's just we haven't yet uh, jumped on uh, that bandwagon. There's no particular reason for it. Uh, they will only work with the BYD range of batteries. Um, I think that's the case. There might be um, another battery option around, but they certainly don't work with the whole range of batteries. Same with Solar Edge, Delta inverters, and um, most of them available will have that limitation. Uh, and if you went backwards again, like I said, if you wanted uh, an LG battery, uh, for example, um, it's not gonna work with a bunch of inverters out there. Uh, it just won't. So we do find that the combination of uh, DC hybrid inverter purchased on its own with a plan for the future is one that, um, yeah, you've got to be, uh, uh, quite careful of that. You've got to be careful as well, um, in general, of the phrase battery ready. So just as I covered, battery ready uh, certainly does not mean ready for any battery. It's just not true. Uh, but you've really got to be careful, especially reading the newspaper and the Facebook ads, because um, there's still a lot of uh, bottom feeders around in the industry who uh, love to uh, play on the English language and get uh, the words wrong. Um, quite often, you'll see them advertise a very, very normal everyday solar system as battery ready. And they'll put the brackets, they'll put brackets next to that and it will say AC battery only. And so going back to the last diagram, um, hopefully it is clear for people looking at this one here. Um, and looking at the fact that over here, you've got what is a normal solar inverter uh, connected to a switchboard. And then that also connected to an 
AC battery, from that diagram there, it's evident that any solar inverter then that connects to a switchboard is battery ready in the sense that it is only if you use an AC battery. So do be very careful of that. There are people out there um, selling systems as battery ready. And in fact, they aren't really. Or what they mean is that if you put the right sort of battery on, then any system is battery ready. So I do hope that that came out clearly. Um, I find that customers do get um, tricked by that, but uh, that's just because you've got people using the word ready when they don't mean the word ready. And so I always have to try and explain um, our way out of that on behalf of the industry. And yeah, we covered this um, verbally um, just a second ago. So yes, um, battery inverters and the batteries themselves are very, very well matched by the manufacturers uh, deliberately. They've often got licensing agreements and uh, technological uh, development agreements as well, which is which is really great. But then you do find yourself limited uh, to those combinations. A good example there was that uh, an older model of Fronius brand inverter called the Primo hybrid that was around now about five, uh, maybe four years ago. I think already uh, you would find that if you bought one of those and you thought you could ring up in a few years time and get a battery, I think you'd find that no battery on the market will work with that inverter anymore. So it was designed initially to work with the range of LG batteries and also um, some of the BYD ones, uh, but their communications protocols and also the stock availability on the LG batteries has, al has already moved on. Right, so you've got to be careful um, when you're making that uh, that choice. Brownfield systems, as um, it was described uh, in the blurb, is where you've already got some solar installed. Now, we find this quite an easy um, arrangement. And the reason is that the AC batteries that are used and um, a Tesla Powerwall is a really good example of that. That's an AC battery. It's designed from the ground up to be installed into somebody's switchboard. And it does not interface in any meaningful way with the existing solar system that's there. So what it means is that it doesn't matter what you've got. You could have a, a 10 year old SMA uh, inverter. You could have a 10 year old Fronius, uh, Eversolar, uh, any brand you can imagine, as long as it pumps out AC electricity, which it will it will run into the switchboard and then the Tesla will um, get installed within that switchboard as well, have all of its monitoring strapped around that. And it uses a more analog way, if you like, of um, counting and, and measuring the AC power flowing through that board to make its own charging and discharging decisions. So it works really, really well. Option one there would be the preferred method, installing an AC battery onto any existing solar system. What you do find though, which is a bit of a um, an unlucky uh, trap is that many solar customers do have quite a small system from many years ago, maybe two kilowatts, something like that, two or three kilowatts. And that system is really only barely, um, if, if at all, covering the power consumption of the home. And it's not really uh, pumping too much back to the grid either. So if you then try to add a battery to that, you'll find that the battery won't uh, get charged uh, very well. And therefore you don't have enough uh, energy in that battery to really meaningfully run your home overnight either. So those people might be talked into adding a completely separate and additional um, uh, solar and hybrid battery system to their existing uh, home. And that works well as well, uh, depending on um, uh, the network area you're in and, and getting through some of those rules, you might stick with an existing two kilowatt solar system. You then might put on say a five kilowatt solar and battery hybrid system onto that. And you'll have then seven kilowatts in total of solar charging really well a five kilowatt uh, or working in unison rather with a five kilowatt solar hybrid system. There were a few questions in the blurb about replacing existing inverters, we found overwhelmingly that that's just not the way of doing it. Uh, the inverter 
uh, in the system itself will probably be too old to be worked on meaningfully. And probably most of you are aware, aware that um, older systems uh, have become, in, in, in most cases, non-compliant. And so if we do work on those systems, they most often will have to be brought up to um, uh, current standards to get a certificate of electrical safety. And that uh, most often won't be granted. And it might be something just as small as the fact that the inverter uh, from say four, five, six years ago doesn't have an earth fault alarm on it or something. And so it, it can't actually be given a, a certificate of compliance, which is a problem. So we uh, always recommend just leaving uh, the existing, existing system in place if it works and if it's there and if that makes sense. Occasionally people are ripping off the whole system and uh, finding a home for that, uh, but that's, um, that's reasonably rare. Sizing, right. So um, just like buying a solar power system, there's no perfect size for you. Um, if you were money bags, uh, sure, you would buy a really big battery system and it would cover um, all of your needs and that'd be great, but batteries still are reasonably pricey and nobody wants to overspend on purpose. The way that we do it at Enviro Group is to uh, try and make sure that we cover off the remainder of your power bill. So in fact, it doesn't matter what existing solar you have, um, it really matters what your remaining power bills are. And so those of you who are familiar with your numbers, if you started off uh, using 10 kilowatt hours a day in your home, and you find that after you've got your solar installed, you'll find that uh, maybe you still use uh, four overnight or maybe six, then that four, uh, let's say, uh, would be a good size to look at putting a, a battery system on to cover that four. And then you've got solar covering during the day and you've got then your four kilowatt hours that gets um, covered with the battery. Now, the problem is that, that seasonally, that changes a lot. And a lot of people still have quite large outstanding winter bills, for example. And then when we look at your bills a bit closer to see whether you've got enough excess power in the system, um, sometimes it works out well, sometimes it doesn't. And if it all works out, then you just add the battery on and away you go and you'll get, uh, I would say in most cases, you'll get most of your remaining bills covered with the battery. And sometimes you might need some more solar, um, but often you don't. So what we would do, if you're calling us up asking for some advice, of course you can do it, uh, do it, do it for yourself. Take your spring or autumn power bills. They're often very average. So they're not um, uh, overly affected by the solar in summer and they're not unrealistically high um, in winter. So you look for your kilowatt hours per day you average that over the period of say spring or autumn, and that would be a size that would make a good amount of sense to get um, for your battery. Um, winters are hard, as I've mentioned a few times, you might want to strike out uh, winter and um, not have too much hope for uh, generating all of that with solar, but you could, right? So let's say the initial recommendation was a seven kilowatt hour battery bank, uh, then given some of the options that are available, you might choose to take a modular system and instead of getting uh, seven kilowatt hours in total, you may choose to get nine or 10 kilowatt hours and you'll, you'll find that quite a, an easy product combination uh, choice to make. Here's an example of a chap who um, installed a battery system with us recently. This is his bill uh, before he got the solar installed. And you can see um, more or less what I was talking about in that the summer bills or anywhere really between September and April are reasonably low as far as the daytime power is con uh, concerned because of the fact that he's got solar power uh, installed. Hopefully you can see my mouse uh, pointing over there. You can tell by the light gray section here that he's got some off peak uh, power consumption here. Uh, that'll be electric hot water. And you can tell that because it doesn't really change that much. It's sort of the same here and just a little bit more over winter. You can see as well with the winter peak, you can see there that the solar power that he has 
uh, isn't making a huge difference in winter, but you can also then um, surmise that um, the battery system that he gets also won't make a huge dent uh, during winter uh, either. So based on this graph, and apologies if my mouse, uh, for whatever reason, is popping in and out of uh, visibility, I'm not really sure why that's the case. What we did here um, is that um, we looked at his bills. Uh, we took an, an annual average of his peak circuit, and we recommended that he puts in um, around about seven kilowatt hours of uh, battery storage, which is going to cover um, most of his months of the year, except for uh, May, June, July, and August. It's going to cover uh, the rest of them nearly 100%, and it's going to cover the uh, winter ones by about half. And that suited one of the products that are available, which was just an AC battery. And this gentleman now um, seems to be quite happy with the lion's share of his peak power consumption, um, not on his bills at all, right, which is great. Uh, so yes, he still will be dealing with his uh, resistive hot water system, as that last commenter said. Um, he's out in the countryside somewhere um, far north of Melbourne with no town gas, I think. And so the decision for him to change from resistive hot water to something uh, better than that, like a heat pump, will be something that he'll be probably sitting on um, from now and just waiting to invest um, his next uh, chunk of um, investment. Um, these are also uh, the bills um, for this person. Um, just showing that in the winter time, this is his um, June bill, just showing there that the export to the grid, uh, which is the solar there, uh, 85 kilowatt hours over the span of um, 30 days, um, shows that he is uh, generating in excess about three kilowatt hours a day into the grid, which shows that for winter, um, he doesn't quite have enough spare electricity to charge this battery but we do have all the rest of his bills and for the rest of the whole entire year he does have enough surplus electricity right so um yeah it's a typical result uh, nine months out of the year the battery system works perfectly well with really good financial returns and for three months of the year not so well but there's no point being um, anything other than completely honest about that battery storage uh, sizes that are available. Um, that little screen there represents um, what our business Enviro Group has uh, available um, to us or what we've chosen to be available. And that would represent the industry as a whole. Uh, the smallest battery that you can get uh, is the brand Enphase. They do nice little, little dinky one kilowatt hour battery units for quite, quite small applications. We've got some modular batteries available as well. There's a few brands around of those. Pile and Text, the one that we like to use, but you can get another brand, Power Plus as well. And then they make modular batteries that are around, say, 2.4, 3.5 kilowatt hours. And you can slot into the battery units, say, um, you know, say four of those or maybe eight of those and come up with your own battery sizing um, combinations. The Tesla power wall, which I will mention a lot because it's it, it's it's very famous. Um, I'm not sure what its sales like are Australia wide, but it may well be uh, the best seller in the country because it's very popular. It works very well. The technology is really good. It's um, good value overall, and they only make it in one size, 13.2 kilowatt hours. And they've done that on purpose, and they've done that to cater for your average larger home. And yeah, it works really well. And you can get two of them side by side. And that there spans the range of what I, what I think is a, a meaningful um, span of, of, um, of energy storages. Types of battery, right? This is uh, probably the section of the, of the chat that um, I was most concerned about. So um, I think it's in the nature of uh, your your uh, your ATA member to want to know a lot about the technologies that are out there. Uh, it's just that with batteries, um, in every meaningful way, 
uh, there almost isn't any other technology out there other than your lithium lithium ion uh, batteries. And there's 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 multiple sorts of those, and there's sub um, subcategories of those. But we're not seeing uh, any sales or any installations or hearing of any installations that aren't um, the everyday sort of lithium-ion batteries. Um, point three there, um, for a short while, there was um, a big selling battery um, called uh, zinc bromide, which is the sort called um, Red Flow. Um, from what I can ascertain, they're not really being used in the residential market um, anymore. And then when you Google uh, what sorts of other batteries there are around, here are some answers that come up on some of your more well-known uh, websites. Uh, lithium titanate, hybrid ion, which is salt water batteries, molten salt batteries, graphene supercapacitors. I'm just not really going to talk uh, much about them because as I said, for all intents and purposes, um, they, they don't exist. They're not on the shelves anywhere. You can't ring us or anyone else up that I know and ask for a price on one um, because they're, they're just not around. That doesn't mean that something won't um, pop up in the future, um, but the general sort of battery that we use, the lithium ion ones, well, they're in our uh, phones, they're in our computers, they're in our cars. Um, there's millions of them uh, that have been produced and, um, and by the by, uh, they, they do work very well. So yeah, there are differences. Um, point one there, the normal lithium ion sort, which is in your Tesla Powerwall, is regarded um, by many to be the more um, basic sort, the more rudimentary sort. Um, it's a bit cheaper uh, to produce. Um, it's a bit smaller. Um, it's charging characteristics are pretty good. Uh, but there's another sort that's seen as being a little bit more premium, and that's your lithium iron, which is I-R-O-N, lithium iron phosphate. And the major decision between those two is that the lithium ion phosphate is the one that doesn't um, catch fire and burn, and that's um, otherwise known as thermal runaway. And people are uh, fairly uh, aware of the fact that a lithium battery um, can burn like crazy. You just need to Google that and have a look at it. Um, that said, I don't know of any instances where it has happened in, in a home um, through us or, or through anybody. Um, a little bit of a, a, a more of an expose there on uh, six different um, sub sorts of lithium uh, ion batteries. Um, the one on the left in green there is, is the favoured one, lithium ion phosphate. Those little spider graphs, I think they're called there, um, tries to talk about six key characteristics. Um, cost being an important one as well. Um, lifespan, obviously very, very uh, important. Performance, which would be its charging characteristics, safety, and then specific energy and specific power uh, relates to energy density, how much energy and power you can get um, into the, the, the physical uh, characteristic, characteristics of the battery. Now, this um, graph is from um, a company called Power Plus Energy. They're an Australian-based uh, battery manufacturer. We don't use a lot of them, um, but they're great, right? They, 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 their product combination uh, tends to suit uh, the more off-grid um, customer. Uh, and just because we're based in Coburg North, right? We don't get a lot of off-grid people calling us up there. We do have a branch out uh, near Castle Main where they get more interest. Uh, but for us in town, um, it doesn't get used very much. So yeah, on this presentation graph here, we're talking about lithium cobalt, lithium nickel manganese cobalt, lithium cobalt, something else, lithium manganese spinel, and lithium titanate. So. A lot of that is lithium is your core metal with a few other bits and pieces in there um, with your electrolytes, your, um, your anode and your cathode as well. Um, I am not going to put on my, my hand on my heart and say that I know much about any of these um, because for me, there are um, many, many more overriding factors and that is just in general, uh, well, it's going to be cost, of course, their effectiveness and also their reliability as a manufacturer. Um, and again, I'll go back to the Tesla Powerwall um, as an example there. Um, they use the more basic sort 
as I said, of lithium-ion battery, but their surrounding technology, their build quality, their engineering support, their technical support, their, their know-how, and their software is exquisite. Right, so all of those things, I think, um, make for a very powerful retail-based um, case. Types of batteries and qualities and variables. Um, you've got the kilowatt hours stored in the battery. The, the uh, previous graph or the one before that showed a range of between one and say 13 kilowatt hours. You've got the depth of discharge. Um, so how much can that battery discharge of its own internal capacity before um, it puts itself in danger, right? So um, it wasn't many years ago where we were all using um, lead acid batteries or lead acid gel batteries, and they had a um, very, very low safe depth of discharge, 30% um, or 50%, or or uh, and the lithium ion ones now have 80% um, or maybe 90%. But the reason I bracketed that as interesting is that the depth of discharge uh, as a marketing number uh, was always very, very attractive uh, to the consumer um, for reasons that uh, once explained uh, didn't have to even make a lot of sense. And so if you had a very, very big and bulky uh, um, lead acid gel battery in a shed um, in the country, and um, you had bought uh, a, a, a usable amount of kilowatt hours, then it's that usable amount that you've bought, right? The fact that it doesn't uh, delve into the, its, its, its own bottom uh, 50% and that the inverter would govern that to me means that that bottom half of it is just irrelevant. So, um, uh, you know, people were all really stuck on that um, for a while. And so, uh, this battery that's called the Red Flow, the um, the, uh, the zinc bromide one, the big red tank with the, the liquid flowing around, um, the marketing people got on board with that uh, because it has a 100% depth of discharge, right? So every part of, or every bit of kilowatt hour, every bit of energy within it could be discharged and used meaningfully. And so that sounds really great, um, but there was another, figure that they were um, um, ignoring and not, not talking about, and that was its round trip efficiency, which is how much energy do you have to pump into one side of the battery um, and have that stored and come back out again, and their round trip efficiency was less than 80%, right, which is less than most of the lithium ion batteries around uh, these days, right. So. Yeah, um, it's not that everyone has to be an expert on all these specifications, but um, really, if you're looking for a battery, uh, you just want to look at its usable kilowatt hours, ignore the rest, and just buy based on usable. Another uh, important thing is its kilowatt output. Kilowatts, of course, is power rather than energy, so they're quite different. Um, a high kilowatt output battery can 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 run more devices at once and therefore um, avoid more grid usage than other batteries. The Tesla Powerwall can do seven kilowatts. So you can have a small air conditioner running off that. You can have toasters, kettles, things like that. Whereas the end phase batteries that we also have available, they've got a very small little 250 watt um, uh, inverter inside them. So even though they can store a good amount of energy when they're charged, it, it dissipates or it discharges very slowly. So if you put on a kettle that's 1200 watts and it starts sucking out of the battery, the battery can only go so fast as to power about one fifth of that kettle. So that's of course not ideal. Energy density, um, how many kilowatt hours or how much charge can it have um, in relation to its mass or its size? may be important for some people, but in general, um, people put batteries these days in their garages, in their carports, and there's plenty of space. And so density is my mind is, is not such an important thing. Um, yep, there's a link there, solarquotes.com.au. Uh, um, that's a quotation website. 
um, that has a really big and long um, uh, battery storage comparison table in there that I'm not, I'm not going to go into that much detail um, today, but there's plenty of, plenty of extra stuff you can read about batteries that, that are on the outskirts of, 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 of being available. Here's just an expose on one of them that we've got. This is not a, a, a promotional piece of material uh, by, any, by any sense. It's just really um, highlighting what a battery does look like. And so um, in contrast to some of the really nice marketing pictures around, this is a brand of battery called Pylon Tech, which is a very industrial type of battery. Um, it's not designed at all to look good or nice or smooth or have nice curves and edges. It's just a really good piece of technology inside a really solid box. Um, it's uh, got 6,000 cycles of life uh, within it, 80% depth of discharge, five kilowatts of power output. It's the slightly more premium sort called lithium iron phosphate. And that's the sort that has no thermal runaway. I love this slide. This is um, a bit of a snapshot of what of what has uh, transpired over the past only four years uh, in our business since I've been um, doing a lot of the batteries. There are um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's 11 batteries on there, um, all of which were talking about uh, how good they were at the time and all of which now are either defunct or not available or broken. Um, I won't go through them all, but you know some, some important ones there. The Samsung battery was... Um, going to be a big seller for a while until it turned out to, um, I'm not really sure, either not work or not be compliant, I think was the answer on that. Um, SMA, the German brand that we love, um, had a, a battery system that um, when it came out was just too expensive. It was too small, too expensive, and so nobody bought it, and so they stopped making it. The one on the right um, was a battery system by Bosch, made in Germany one of the more expensive battery systems that I've ever seen. And I, I never was involved in anyone buying it. It was just too expensive. You've got even Mercedes-Benz battery down the bottom. They got into the battery storage market for a while and then got out almost immediately uh, when they figured out that no one was buying their product and it was just too expensive. There's a picture of the Red Flow battery to the top right there. That's the um, probably the only, only other competing technology that I've been aware of that has made um, a little bit of inroads. Um, um, now I see a, there's a question uh, popping up from time to time on the chat about which batteries have the best uh, uh, you know, kilowatt hour uh, value. And that one certainly wasn't one of them. So if you're shopping around for how many kilowatt hours of storage you can get uh, per dollar, um, that, that also was a product that, that almost priced itself out of the market. It didn't include an inverter, um, by the way, which is one of the things that, that, that pushes the price up. You've got to put an inverter um, with it. Um, battery system pricing, right? So um, I'm very, very happy to be uh, completely transparent about what some of the pricing is like um, to get a battery system. Um, on this particular slide here, um, the, the point of me um, having this one is to really talk about what I started off talking about uh, in that uh, if you buy a battery system, um, calling it a system rather than just a battery, it's really important to acknowledge that you're getting a lot of other things other than the battery itself. And it feeds into things about pricing drops and value and all of that. So a typical size combination might be 11 and a half kilowatt hours of battery storage. Um, these are current um, uh, market uh, prices for things that we would sell at the moment. You're talking um, nearly seven and a half thousand dollars worth of battery. You need to have uh, the hybrid inverter with that, of course, and uh, that's based on the Redback model, the 5,000. You've got $4,100 there. You've got an enclosure that you need that's got to be really solid and really hard wearing to store those batteries in it of $1,400. Um, and you've got labor of about $1,500 as well. And that's for a basic everyday installation. So if you add all of that up, you'll see that the actual battery part is only half of the price. And so, yeah, that's important, I think, to know because you get the people in the media 
saying, oh, battery prices have come down and, you know, they're about to come down a lot more. And uh, let's imagine that battery prices came down by uh, 20%. Let's just imagine that. That would be a good news headline. Uh, 20% of that figure there, 7,500, is about 1,500. And you, that, that sounds great. But then all of the other prices there uh, likely won't change. So it, 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 in fact, isn't a 20% reduction on the whole thing. Um, it's a 20% reduction on just the battery part. So customers do get disappointed when they hear about those pricing indicators. Ring us up a few years later and so and and find out that 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 not a lot has changed. Here's a real life pricing breakdown um, again of, of um, just with another format coming straight out of our um, quotation system. These are for the people that really do want to know exactly how much a battery system costs. This is the Redback SB7200, which is an AC battery. There are some um, switchboard works on that one that's required to get the switchboard up to scratch. There is, um, there is um, um, fireproofing on that quote required if you're going to install that battery up against a weatherboard home. And there is um, battery design and commissioning. Those prices start off being XGST, and then GST gets added on. You're talking then about an 11-ish, $11,300 um, installation. And um, then you've got the Solar Victoria rebate, if applicable, on top of that, $3,500. And so that price there, including GST of 7758 would be a really realistic price for people to expect to be asked uh, to pay um, if they ring up and they want um, that battery. And just off the cuff too, I've noticed a couple of comments coming through about the overall value of a battery system, um, everything added up, and then the lifespan of the battery divided into that. Um, so that maths is pretty straightforward to do. I'm not here tonight to say whether or not that you should get a battery or not or if indeed they're good value for you to get or not. Um, but I think it's a very, very astute question. If you're about to spend $7,760 on a battery um, and you think it might only last seven years, well, um, maybe, it, maybe it's not for you, right? Um, so, you know, some of the batteries are better value than that um, overall because they're bigger. Um, some people will get... Um, a lot better battery utilization if they're bigger and their um, systems are uh, designed ideally. Uh, different rebates in different parts of the country. Uh, brick installations are cheaper than weatherboard houses and some switchboards are more suitable than others. So yes, you can pay less than this for your installation, but it's going to be in that territory. Um, and I'll just uh, answer while the chat questions are coming up about lifespan. It's far too early to comment on battery lifespan at the moment. We don't know what's going to happen to them in seven years. What we do know is that a bunch of older batteries that were in the early phases um, you know, aren't performing um, that well. Um, thanks, Tim, for that comment. And uh, what we do know is that the bigger brands of batteries, right? So they're, they're all household names these days, LG, uh, BYD, uh, Tesla. Uh, we know that the lion's share of all of them are all still working really well. And they're working well and truly within or over and above their um, specifications, right? So that's um, having lost only say 4%, 3% of their capacity. And they look like they're well and truly on track to be well within their warranty conditions of say a 10 or 20% loss in, um, in state of charge. Um, health um, at say the 10 year mark. So you should still have a battery that's working 80% of its original capacity at the 10 year mark, right? It seems to be uh, well and truly doable. There are some rebates um, available. Now, um, this is the Victorian one. I'm based in Victoria. I don't have my head around what's going on with the South Australian battery rebate uh, at all or in other states of Australia. So I apologize for that. Uh, but there's a three and a half thousand dollar present up for grabs. If you haven't um, claimed money from Solar Victoria before, 
and if you have an existing or accompanying five kilowatt system that you plan to put in with a bit, a bit of an income test there, and it's got to be uh, your main residence. So that's really great, right? People have wanted to read about batches for ages and it's good that it exists. A question about house rewiring. This is a direct quote from the blurb again. Are there any changes to the house wiring so the battery can act as a backup system during grid failures? The answer is a resounding yes. It's very underestimated the fact that we need to um, sometimes completely rewire, not your home, but your switchboard in order for a battery storage and backup system to work. So in essence, the, um, the battery will only be able to cope with a proportion of your home in most cases. And so your switchboard needs to be partitioned into essential and non-essential loads. And that can be quite um, a laborious um, amount of work. You might have um, circuits in your home that are just too big to deal with and they might need to be split up as well. So if you did ever get a quotation for us, you, you, you might see line items like partial backup. You might see line items like splitting of sub-circuits. Um, you would need to put in um, some control switches in your switchboard and monitoring as well. And lots of homes, especially inner city homes, just have switchboards that are simply not up to scratch. And so it can be disappointing. You can respond to an ad saying, hey, batteries, uh, you know, hey, 7,000, 9,000, something like that. And then you might find out that there's $2,000 worth of uh, switchboard work that's required. And that's never good news to deliver uh, to anybody, but it's just got to be done and it can be a bit off-putting. So a typical switchboard in someone's home would look more or less like that. It's a recessed board. It doesn't have a lot of switches in it. It's got a fairly old fashioned safety switch in there. That one there is about an eight uh, pole board, for example, with only two spare spots. Now we need six spare spots for a battery installation. So for, for, for a start, that's out. Um, um, you can tell it's got an oven in it, right? There's a red sticker there for a wall oven, uh, an electric resistive, resistive element oven, and a battery system will not cope with that, right? Ovens draw 2400 or 3600 watts and batteries just aren't designed to deal with it. So that needs to be partitioned off. And so there's a lot of work in there, right? So we need to be able to um, bring your switchboard to a state that looks almost like that. Now that's a very proud installation of our installation team just done just today. So I asked them for some good photos of some good installs and that's what a new fancy, lovely, spacious switchboard looks like. Um, all modern and new RCBO switches extra space there for monitoring and extra space for the future as well to deal with maybe an, an, an electric car, a charging point, um, inductive cooktops, uh, things like that. So um, yeah, you can imagine that there's a lot of work changing the previous board that into that, right? So the answer is yes, switchboard rewiring is required. Quick summary there, um, yeah, batteries need at least six spare slots in the switchboard. There's a limited output of most of the systems, but the bigger, more expensive ones have a higher output than others. Um, sometimes you can get a whole house backed up. So I know I mentioned the word power wall a lot. It's just that it, for me, it mentions the biggest battery we have. And so we'll just substitute for that. If you've got a reasonably uh, contained house without electric cooking and a big aircon, you can get the whole house backed up with a power wall and, and it's a cheaper installation because there's no extra switchboard work required. If you buy one of our smaller batteries and the Redback battery is one of them, it's not designed to back up a whole house. So even though the battery is cheaper, you might need to spend a bit more money on the switchboard to get it up and running. So solar now and batteries later. Um, that's again responding to um, one of the uh, questions in the um, the blurb. Um, my current advice, if people are really kind of you know trying to figure it out, put normal solar in now, but make it big. Make it as big as you can stomach now. So panels are really cheap at the moment. Um, solar, everyday solar power is um, very, very, very well known and very well understood. 
you'll find it painful to try and expand it later on. I can almost assure you of that. So if you were thinking of getting X size, just make it bigger than that. Um, don't put in a battery ready inverter, right? That's normally my advice. And that's simply because technology changes too quickly. And there are AC batteries that you can always get to um, add on to those and they'll likely improve in value and range as well. And the whole thing means that the whole future proofing concept that we're always asked to do, it is very hard. We must have a, a dozen, several dozen customers that tried to future proof their wiring um, several years ago and they're now disappointed that it didn't work, right? So um, the battery wiring arrangements have changed. Uh, battery um, installation guidelines have changed, things like um, conduiting and cable protection, things like that have changed. And um, every once in a while, we get some annoying little rule that only electricians understand, um, like not being able to have batteries on RCVOs, for example, or RCDs, they change. And it means that the wiring that we put in changed and um, everything's got to be redone. So yeah, future-proofing, really hard to do. The advantages of adding a battery, right? Again, another question that was asked in the blurb. Um, um, hopefully I've uh, gotten most of that through so far. So yep, catch and store your excess solar power. That's exactly what they're for. Run your home overnight um, using that stored power. Um, extra charge if your battery is too small can still come from the grid, which is great. You can charge your battery overnight using uh, off-peak power and achieve at almost zero load on the grid on a daily basis. I always put the word almost in there because I get in trouble um, if I say zero. Um, but quite commonly, we're getting people that are running off 99% cell power at the moment, which is astonishing. It's amazing that we're there. Here are some screen grabs that I grabbed literally off our monitoring portals um, today. Um, this is from the Redback uh, monitoring system. The red is um, all energy, right, that has gone back into the grid, right? So, so these people are overproducing their power. The blue is all that they've bought from the grid. So you can tell what the weather's been like on these days. Bad weather um, on the Friday and the Saturday, that's live, right? So that's over the weekend. And then I headed off um, to Port Ferry on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday's the big one. Tuesday was a great day. So these people have bought basically nothing from the grid that day and they've overproduced and exported back to the grid on that day, which is fantastic. So 95% self-produced energy, renewable energy for that week. This chap here, um, he's running at 99%, um, which is simply astonishing, right? So um, sometimes I catch myself even during these presentations um, in light of what you hear on the media and all the rubbish that goes around and things that are possible and things that aren't possible. You know, who would have thought um, that in the year 2021 that we can have homes that are running off 99% self-produced local renewable energy for amounts of money that definitely don't break the bank, right? We're not talking about systems here that are twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. We're talking about systems that all up would have cost these people between ten and 20000 And we're getting um, the whole thing, the whole thing produced um, by solar. Just one little pipsqueak of energy was needed um, by this person to run their house on Saturday. It must've been a bad weather day. I think that's just fantastic. Living with a battery system. Well, uh, in particular, you don't need to do anything, right? It all works on its own. If everything goes well, uh, it just gets put in and you end up with a result um, like that mostly, or uh, if not like that, but you just sit around and the house runs itself. Uh, the solar transitions to the battery seamlessly overnight and then the battery transitions back to solar seamlessly um, in the morning. Uh, you can look at all the graphs and the monitors and everything you've got uh, to monitor the kilowatt input from the batteries and the solar, um, just to make sure 
that um, you're not drawing uh, too much instantaneously, right? Little examples there. If you're going to put on in your kitchen, your kettle and your microwave, um, you might then draw too much um, uh, current or, uh, or power um, um, through your switchboard and the battery and uh, solar in conjunction may not be able to deal with that at once. Now, you won't notice that, um, but it will simply pull more in from the grid, right? Whereas if you can just use your kettle first and then your microwave second, um, you will find that both things are handled very, very well. Um, so I do that in my ha home all the time. I've just got solar. I don't have the battery yet. Um, and when I sit home during the day and work, um, if I want to use my washing machine and then my dishwasher, for example, and a little bit of um, electric heating, um, if I put them on um, in sequence, um, my um, solar to the grid graph still stays, stays um, at zero and I'm not using anything at all um, from the grid. Whereas if I'm unlucky and put them all on the same time, I'll, I'll, I'll draw too much and then I'll be using grid power. Right, so little things like that um, are all you need to do. If you've got blackout protection, which most of the systems that we sell do, um, the thing is there are very rarely blackouts anyway, right? So you're never gonna know if they work or not. So just test it once in a while, flip the switch off in the switchboard, just make sure everything kicks in, uh, make sure it's all set up uh, correctly and experiment with yourself as far as what you can um, and can't use. Uh, backup systems, um, yep, so the batteries, again, they are limited to how much they can um, generate at the same time. So usually we'll limit your essential loads to uh, fridge, kitchen, TV, roll a door for your car so you don't get your car stuck inside your house. Small circuits, maybe a small aircon. And um, if it's a really big system, we can experiment with adding larger heat pump based um, heating systems and air cons to your essential loads as well. So yes, you can think about sitting at home on a muggy summer's evening um, with the grid out, running your home um, off um, solar and battery power. Um, this is what a graph of the monitoring looks like, right? Um, it'll be hard to digest from this screen, but um, you get an oversupply of information when you get a battery system installed. It's one reason that you might like to get one. You get um, um, very, very transparent uh, control and knowledge over how your home is working. So the main gist of this graph is that you can see the sun um, rising and falling there um, with the solar curve. You can see that the battery gets charged up by about 11 o'clock in the day and it stays charged uh, all day. And you can see that it starts to drop off and run the home overnight and go empty. And kicking in that morning, you can see that the battery runs down nice and steady. And then this particular person has had their whole home run for free uh, for their whole day um, with a combination of solar and battery, which is great. Um, a few more examples of what some of the monitoring looks like that you'll get. Um, this is from the Tesla uh, portal. I think they may have updated their software since then. It looks a bit differently. So you'll get a nice little power flow graph showing you the directionality of solar in from the grid into the battery, from the battery to the house and vice versa. You get all these massive spiky graphs about your load um, throughout the day. And then a nice little percentage perhaps at the end saying, hey, self-powered by 98% which is great. An expanded version of that with a few arrows that someone's done showing um, where and what they've used, right? Coffee in the morning, coffee's cheap, which is great. Spas, clothes, dryer, expensive um, um, electric vehicles. So what is the future? Well, the future um, is hard to know, um, of course, Here's what I think, this is not based on any particular research uh, at all, but I think that batteries will um, continue to improve and I think that's a given. I think the pricing of batteries uh, in general will fall at least based on volume. And I think that um, you'll find that the ancillary equipment may get stuck 
a little bit and not really change uh, too much. I think that um, I think that as far as future actual technology, I think that you'll find that if something new comes, it'll come out of the blue, and we won't really see it. And that's been my experience um, in about 25 years of um, electronics retail. You can try all if you like to predict what's going to come out, but there are so many other factors at play that are over and above the technology itself. All right, you've got who's who's building it, how it works, um, its reliability, um, the support, all of that. So in a sense, perhaps the future is here, given that we've got 99% self-power possible in people's homes. Um, that's my last slide. So I do thank you all for uh, sitting through that. Um, in the post-COVID world, I don't get to see any of, you, any of you looking back at my face and I can't tell whether you even had half a good time um, or not. Um, but I will answer questions in a little while. I'm going to do um, a little thing, um, a personal matter. It'll take me about 10 minutes and I'll hand it over to Rob, who I think is about to speak for a bit, and I will come back. So thank you temporarily. Thank you, Paul, that was great. Very extensive. Um, what we propose to do now is to hold the questions to Paul to later on, and I'll get Howard to come in now and give a talk about his own system at home. And then if we still need to fill in, I'll talk about my system. Uh, so how are you available to take over? I'm online, so uh, let me just share my screen, show you what I've got here. Uh, yeah, so excellent. Lots of information there from Paul. So what I thought I'd do now is just give you a perspective from somebody from the other side, from the client side. So this would be uh, my experience in um, specifying a greenfield solar and battery system uh, from the person who's actually going to be living with it. So really my objective here is to just share the sorts of questions that I asked uh, of the person I was working with to design the system and uh, really make the point here that I'm not trying to say this is the answer and I'm sure Paul would agree with that too. Everybody's got a different situation so there's no one right answer for this but this is just where we ended up when we were looking at our build here. So first question we started with was this should we be off grid or on grid for this whole thing? Because when you're doing a greenfield site, you do actually have that choice, whether you want to be connected to the grid or not with a battery system. Um, we went grid connected, two reasons for that. Uh, it, it gave us the opportunity to export excess power back to the grid, which is your traditional summer issue. And then you've usually got grid power as a backup. Um, if something goes like it's not a good sunny day, um, the battery is discharged for whatever reason in winter. So it's just nice to have the grid there as a backup system. So we made the decision early on just to stay grid connected, even though we had the battery there. Uh, the next thing we looked at was actually on the solar panels. Um, we wanted to make sure we squeezed the most out of them that we could um, because we, were, we, we already made the decision to get a battery. Um, we made sure that the solar panels, we had to get as much solar electricity from them as we could. So we specified an optimizer per panel. So the idea here is that we, we weren't worried then about one panel being shaded and then our system being cut down to that capacity. So that was something that was actually on the solar panels that was a, a particular specification we put in there to make sure that we got the maximum amount we could from each panel that was running. Uh, and then, as you've seen, there's, it's, it's a little bit of a, a confusing world when you get into this, some of this stuff, because there's AC, there's DC, there's lots of choices to be made here. Um, so one of the things that we found right from the start was to ask that question about grid failure, uh, to make that decision about whether you want battery backup if the grid's gone. Um, is that something that's important to you? Uh, because if it is, then that's a question you need to ask whoever's quoting your system to make sure that whatever they're providing uh, does have that facility to it. Uh, I'm not sure if all the systems do, and it might be one of those questions you say, well, I'm just assuming it would do because it's a battery, 
Uh, and my experience would be that sometimes what you think is a silly question is actually a very important one because not all systems are the same. And unless you have that as a question, you may end up with a system that doesn't actually back you up when the grid fails because the, uh, the inverter is not capable of islanding itself. So um, to make sure we got that, it was really working with an experienced installer, somebody who had lots of experience, uh, knew the trade very well, and we were able to have these sort of discussions and make sure that that grid failure backup was part of the specification for the system that was going to be installed. So that's um, an important one there. Uh, the next thing worthwhile talking about would be the default operating mode for the, the battery, the inverter and your solar panels. Um, really, I suppose, from your perspective, get an understanding of what it's going to do. How does it balance all those inputs and outputs? What's going to your house? What's coming from the solar panels? The, what's the battery doing? How does the grid fit into all of this? So we ended up actually specifying that we wanted to maximise self-consumption so that the last thing it would do would be to pull electricity in from the grid. Now, again, that, that's probably a very standard thing, but it's worthwhile spending a bit of time talking with people who are providing the systems, really just to understand, it, is that what it does? Uh, and just to probe a little bit and find out is it really going to be set up that way? Or is there a standard system that they have that is not actually going to do what you want? So our, our system very much, uh, okay, if there's solar pumping out, um, it's going to the house. If the battery's not charged, it's going to the battery. Um, and then at night time, make sure the battery is, is exhausted before any sort of grid import happens. So it's one of those things, I think for your own understanding, just to, to run through it and make sure you know what this battery system is going to be doing for you and how it will operate in default mode. Uh, and then as Paul said, what information is available? Um, data is king when it comes to this. Uh, if you can get your hands on real-time data, you can make really good decisions. Um, how much is coming from the panels? What's the battery charge state? Um, where are you at with grid import or export? So usually if, if you've got a good system, there's an app that goes with it, which gives you lots and lots of information. And then it just depends on how much of that you want to use. Um, but really understanding what your system is doing real time is much better than getting, say, information from your energy retailer, which won't cover what your battery's doing and will only tell you what happened in, in the past 24 hours. So you can use this sort of data to make decisions, as Paul was saying, about what you run and when you run it. Uh, if your battery looks like it's running a little bit low, do you really need to do that load of washing or run that electrical appliance that day? Can it wait for another day or another time? So you can monitor what's going and, and make the best out of your system. Uh, then you get down to the brand of inverter plus battery. Uh, and again, um, really you're down to AC, DC, uh, the pairings of these things is very important. So as Paul pointed out, you almost go down a pathway. And once you start down that pathway, you begin to narrow the options. So it's, it's not a broad playing field. Um, the type of battery. Um, so what we're seeing here is, again, we relied on our experience installer to help us through that process because it can be a very daunting decision to make and, and you need some information yourself, you need to be aware of what's going on, but I think you also need somebody on the other side who understands your needs and can give you some expert advice based on their experience in the industry. So probably having somebody who's got a lot of background uh, would be a good choice there. Uh, battery capacity, again, well, that comes down to how much you're thinking of using basically at night in winter, really, that seems to be the peak demand time. So uh, in our case, we were building a new house. So we had to do some predictions on that based on what we thought the house would need. Uh, and then it comes down to, all right, how many kilowatt hours do we think? Uh, what are the standard battery capacities? Again, you, you can't nominate a particular size. Um, you just have to go with what the manufacturer of that particular brand has, and then look at the cost and try and put those factors into the mix and then come up with what you think would be a battery capacity that would suit you. Now, we also mentioned there, Paul was talking about the backup circuits during a grid failure. So again, this, this would be important if, if your system is designed for grid failure, what are the circuits that are going to be on that? Um, now, with a greenfield site, that's pretty easy because you just go, okay, we're building it. So the circuit board will be built this way. Uh, and then you've got to think about what the inverter and battery can supply. So how much load can they cope with? 
And then if they're coping with that load, how long will they last? So do you want to ride through an extended uh, grid failure? How long do you think it would last? Uh, and then you can get a good prediction on that. And then that's where in our system, we've got dedicated circuits which are nominated. Um, so you can see here, there's certain light and power circuits in our house. Uh, and then we've also, we've managed to get the air conditioner. So it's a heat pump system. So that's also on the protected circuits. But things like the induction cooktop, the oven, um, some of the other circuits don't come anywhere near the backup because we think we can do without them for a grid failure, but we'd like to keep these ones running. And that will give us plenty of time uh, on those limited circuits to just keep them operating during the failure. Now, just a final thought. Uh, this would be, if you really, really want to get into the, the background of this, does the inverter actually allow you to program alternatives? Um, can you modify what it does from the default? And a couple of situations that occurred to me, this is what I was talking to the electrician about. Um, for example, uh, in wintertime, when you're probably a little bit short on solar, can you modify the system so it will actually import off-peak grid power where you pay the minimum amount? So you're not getting as much solar production during the day on the panels. You know the battery is going to run out, maybe late afternoon or evening when the peak's coming in. So can you actually import off-peak grid the night before and have that in the battery and then run through the next day? So option like that. Um, people with EVs, um, you really don't want to have your EV charging overnight and have the battery run down because if you're on self-consumption, it will see that as a load. If you're trickle charging a, an EV, uh, it will run your battery down at night and then that's it, you've lost the charge. So can you isolate the battery in periods when you want to trickle charge at night time for whatever reason? So little things like that you might be able to do, that's the sort of thing you can ask the installer. Uh, can I get more control over what this thing is doing rather than just the default mode? Um, that would only be the case if you thought you're confident enough to actually work with a program. Um, but I, I found once you understand what it's doing, get some experience with it, there's actually quite a bit of flexibility in some of these systems. They're more than just a battery on an inverter. You can actually control the way your system interacts with the grid and the way it operates. Um, now, in terms of what we ended up with, um, it's a DC couple system. We've got an eight kilowatt array, solar edge panels with optimizers on it. Uh, it's a storage hybrid inverter. It's a six kilowatt uh, standard system there. And we've got a LG Energy, it's an RES U10H battery. It's got a, a standard capacity of 9.3 kilowatt hours in it. So that's, that's the system we came up with for our house. Now, obviously, Key thing here is that's good to talk about, but what does that mean? Um, so does it work? Uh, now, again, this is where one system doesn't fit all. So a little bit of perspective. We've got a two bedroom. It's an all electric house. It's a high performance home. Uh, it's an 8.4 star rated home. And we do have two EVs that we charge. So it's a completely electric system. So that just looking at the data here, um, you can see what we've done uh, July, winter time. So our total energy bill in July was $79 for that. Now we did import 300 odd kilowatt hours of electricity. That was mainly me making a decision there. I was either off peak EV charging to have the cars ready for the next day, or I was topping up the battery because we weren't getting sufficient solar power coming through. So we imported uh, net 250 kilowatt hours. Now you can see the change here when you get into the, the sun's a bit higher, the day's a bit longer and the solar panels are now starting to pump. So in October last month, our total energy cost was $5. Our grid import was 10 kilowatt hours. And we actually exported 470. So that's running an all electric house, two EVs, and we are just a tiny, tiny dot on the grid system because in general, we um, produce all the electricity we need to run the house and we actually export all the excess going out. So that, to me, just reinforces what Paul was saying before, that uh, the battery just helps us essentially eliminate the nighttime demand. So we're completely, well, almost completely independent of the grid. So there you go. Um, that was my experience in terms of specifying and actually using uh, a battery system. So I'll just finish that there. Well done, okay. Howard. Um, are there any specific questions come through for Howard on his system, which we should cover now or? 
Um, yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I see Lindsay's got it. Something's not on the backup circuit. Does it always draw from the mains? Yeah. So I suppose from our perspective, not from the mains, what it would mean is the inverter would normally handle it. So the inverter plus the battery plus the grid would handle it. So if the demand got too big, we would just import a bit of grid. But in general, we've got, I think it's the, the battery's rate at seven kilowatts and uh, the solar on top of that. Right, and is Paul back by any chance? Do you want to answer your questions or shall I take over and try and run very quickly for what I prepared this afternoon? No response, so I will do that. I think we've got Paul back with us now. Oh, hi, Paul. Do you want to um, take over? Yeah, that'd be great. Um... Uh, did uh, someone want to package those questions? Or I, I've got the the Q and A open. There's um, thirty one questions. Or did you want to triage them, somebody? I was going to try and triage them. Uh, all yeah, my colleagues yep. are going to try and triage them. But yep, um, I'm happy to uh, to respond to anything that is asked. <laughs> I think just take it from the top. They've probably already been sorted a bit. Oh, right. I see. Okay. Um, I'll let you start Greg, while I get my screen back. Yeah, Greg asks about um, recycling lithium-ion batteries. Um, look, I, I, I agree that that's a big deal. Um, I don't, I, I'm not the one that has the answer to that. I... I um, I, I am aware that there are recycling facilities uh, that take the job uh, very seriously and the consumer pays for that. So there is a lot of good metal in them. And um, yeah, you can pay uh, if you want to do proper cradle to grave yourself, um, then uh, exercising due diligence and paying somebody to take apart and recycle that battery is probably um, what you should do, right? So they also talk about sending them um, into less um, emission critical areas. And so if the battery still has 50% health, then it's a 50% good battery and it can be given away or um, reused or repurposed uh, from that point of view. And there are some startups around again that I've only heard of that do that, take them apart, reuse them again. Um, the warranty issue of um, 40 degrees, look, I, I would just encourage um, each person to um, uh, look into each battery that they're thinking of, 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 of doing and looking into the, um, the warranty themselves. All the warranty documents are all available online. Um, hand on heart, I don't, we don't have any uh, warranty problems where um, the batteries have failed, where the manufacturer has has said that it's to do with um, uh, temperature too high. Um, 40 degrees obviously is something that's becoming a, a more of a problem um, in Australia. Um, batteries can go outside, um, of course, and that'll get hot. Uh, they can be in a garage or somewhere cool, and that would be better. I don't have a really good uh, answer to that because the only honest answer would be if there have been breakages that manufacturers have then declined on the warranty. Um, look, of course, uh, yeah, if the warranty pr precludes that, yeah, you'd have to um, really be careful about that. And I know that the, the bigger battery installations, the professional ones, uh, have a cooled uh, battery enclosure. Um, which is going to be something that your average homeowner will will struggle to do. Paul asks, is it possible to run a full DC home? Look, that's a typical um, academic style question that we do get from time to time. Um, of course, it would be possible. Um, you've got to have DC appliances everywhere and they're super hard to get. Your um, They're super hard to get, uh, you know, that... Um, that, 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 that those appliances. Um, the academic answer as well is that yes, if you keep everything in DC, then your system is more electrically efficient, which is great. 
but um, but then the pragmatic answer is well hypothetically let's say it's uh, 10% more efficient well if you're spending 10% more money on it uh, then you're buying 10% less capacity somewhere and so so you've achieved uh, no real gain there so most people um, based on just sheer product availability uh, would be very happy to see some DC to AC and then AC to DC, uh, DC conversion losses so that they then get access to the market that has the very, very best of, of, of efficient appliances um, all running in AC. Um, data about uh, lithium Did chemistry. Ask, yeah, do you have any data that you can share on lithium chemistry? Uh, I don't. Uh, because I keep asking for it from the manufacturers and they're not giving it to me. Um, so I don't know. Ask what round trip efficiency are we seeing? In other words, what percentage of the electricity input is lost? As well? uh, yep. So again, I, I don't have data on that uh, because the monitoring consoles aren't aren't talking about that very much either. Um, some of the boffins out there might be able to do it with spreadsheets spreadsheets and all of that. Um, I'm only presuming that they're working as the spec sheets say, which are typically 95% or 90% um, in, in uh, round trip in and out from the battery. Hydrogen hydride batteries, no, I don't have an opinion um, on that. Um, my apologies for not being tech heavy in this, um, uh, presentation. I've just seen so many technologies on the testing bench that haven't made it, and until we see them, I don't. I don't personally. I don't. I don't have an answer. Basil asks, he's totally off grid. Ten panels, two point six kilowatt, using an SMA Sunny Boy, twenty four two volt lead acid batteries. Is there a system display that I can see how much power is left available for use, please? Yes, our question then for Basil is that it's nothing to do with the SMA Sunny Boy, um, unless he's got uh, another sort of inverter, if he's got the old style um, Sunny Island, then um, I would recommend calling um, SMA and seeing whether there's a modern uh, data card or data um, addition to, to that because it's very, very, very much about the inverter, uh, not the solar one, but the battery one. So you'd, 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 you'd ring up the manufacturer of that and see um, what you can get out of them for that. And John asks, is an AC battery what solar qu quotes calls an all-in-one unit? Um, if it's an all-in-one battery, yes. Um, but if it's a... Uh, so this comparison table, I had that open on my thing as well. I'm not sure. I can have a look at that. Um, it could mean a hybrid solar uh, solar inverter battery unit, or it could mean all in one battery, which would be an AC battery. It could mean either, either of those things, John. Give uh, Finn, Finn, Finn Peacock a call, send him a note and have him um, explain his own um, uh, content uh, a little bit better. So it could be either one of those two things. Anonymous um, asks if he's got a Tesla AC battery, will it work in a blackout? Yes, it will, if you um, got it wired up correctly. So the Tesla battery can do what's called islanding and it will um, um, replicate a mini grid and keep the solar inverter running. And they work beautifully well like that. Um, there's a bit of uh, electrical wiring required in that solution. And if you buy the really cheap deals out there, notoriously, I think, although can't be quite sure from some of your power companies, they won't wire it up like that because it's the it's it's not it, it's it's hardly ever required. So you pay for the basic install and you get the self-use version only but in theory yes absolutely you can do it and it's a wonderful product for that and john asking there is a separate row for ac or dc coupled all-in-one systems only so i assume that means the ones capable of ac coupling and he's referring uh, back yeah to that looks like a reference back one. to the solar quotes column 
uh, mm -hmm. which is not my column. That's uh, yeah, that looks at the third party website. So I'd uh, interrogate that a bit better. Um, so Ken is asking, does AC system require a dedicated circuit switch board to the battery or uh, the AC battery circuit includes AC power outlets? Could I use an existing circuit from the main switch board to the garage sub board? AC system require a dedicated circuit. Uh, look, to be honest, I don't quite understand that question. Um, I'm sorry. So I think, so I think if I understand it right, so, so all of the power from the AC battery goes into the switchboard and then from there, your switchboard can behave as normal. And so you can run, uh, from the main switchboard to the garage subboard. Yes, definitely. And then the AC battery would then power the garage as well. Yeah, I'm thinking it doesn't need a dedicated switchboard. It just goes into the current switchboard. Correct. It? Yeah, it goes in there in, in parallel. It's correct. So Tim is asking, when is solar PV too small to consider a battery? It's a market-based decision, Tim. If there were batteries that were good value, you could do it. So I've got um, maybe four lovely, lovely, um, all female actually customers who have small end phase battery systems. They've only got say six or seven panels with end phase micro inverters on them. And then they've got uh, two or three end phase batteries. And so they'll, they'll store a grand total of two or three kilowatt hours a day and they're very happy with them. Um, they don't run uh, any backup because they don't work that way, but they're very happy, right? So they're, they're very frugal people that use four or five kilowatt hours a day, and they've got three of it running for free with the solar and two of it or three running for free with the battery in the evening. So I would say nothing's too small, it's just that they're not incredibly good value. Mm. Yeah. So no cut no cutoff size, Tim. Kevin is saying the daily supply charge is greater than any savings from solar. So how do we get off the grid? Well, Kevin, um, if you want to cut your nose off to spite your face, you can just very easily get off the grid and snip, snip the cord and buy an off-grid system and be done with it. Uh, we have two people in inner city Melbourne who have done that. They spent between fifty and sixty thousand dollars on their off-grid system, and they're very happy being off the grid. And if you spend fifty to sixty thousand dollars on your off-grid system living in the city, you can very easily about calculate that for the measly one dollar twenty a day that they sting you, uh, four hundred dollars a year connection fee, you can very easily calculate that you spent way more money going off grid than you ever would have spent um, connecting yourself to the grid, right? So it's a monetary decision only. And I'd also argue you're doing a benefit by putting power back into the grid. So it's saving the grid power overall. Without a doubt, it's 100% efficient. Almost every single electron that is generated in excess goes directly to your neighbor. Um, as far as where the electric electrons go. So yeah, it's an astute comment as well. So Sharon asks, also doing EV charging, do you know, to, do you need to go for a bigger size battery? That is a red back Tesla. It's a, it's a, it's a peculiar question that people are asking us a lot. Um, with the presumption that they would want to charge their EV with their home battery. And to me, I haven't yet got my head around it yet. It sounds, sounds like a very expensive way of charging a car. That is to get solar power to charge a battery that in then would discharge itself then into the car. Um, the answer is yes, of course you need a bigger system, right? So a Tesla vehicle will store 
um, uh, 95 kilowatt hours, right, which is a huge amount of energy that's um, six or seven or eight times the average home. And so um, you would then take, uh, you would then figure out how much a day extra your EV would use. And then, yes, you would size your, you would treat that as an appliance and you would add, say, five or 10 kilowatt hours a day onto your daily um, usage and you would size your solar system up for that and then figure out whether you really wanted to charge one your EV with the battery or whether you were happy to charge it perhaps off peak uh, overnight or whether you want to uh, charge that uh, during the day with solar. And yes, Howard could perhaps um, talk about that. And also you could um, have your Tesla change its battery level. You don't have to have it full all the time. So if you didn't have power available uh, from your own system, you just let the Tesla run down because you don't need your whole 90 kilowatts in your Tesla. Mm. And then when it's a sunny day, you charge it up a bit more. Mm. 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 So it's probably more on the solar than the battery. I'd have thought, yeah, the battery, mm. you wouldn't increase its size too much. Yep. And Henrik asks, a Swedish presenter at the recent International Passive House Conference mentioned that refurbished industrial batteries can be given another afterlife in buildings. Is such a reuse idea compliant in Australia? Yeah, I don't have the answer to that question. Battery compliance is complicated and uh, there's a few factors and a few big name uh, industry so-called bodies that get involved lots of certificates and engineering things and it's 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 a few pay grades above uh, my head. Um, I think yeah. it's practical isn't it? There's nothing well, technically. It, it, uh, well it, technically no but um, all systems need to be if they're going to be connected to the grid for example if it's a grid connected battery system then that battery needs to be accredited for that and so that goes through Clean Energy Council accreditation processes and down in, in Victoria Solar Victoria processes as well and I know of numerous batteries that on paper were 100% suitable, uh, but took you know months and months and months to get the application to the bodies approved and, and no one really knows why, right? So compliance is a very um, hot topic in Australia. And Hunter asks a question, which I think you'll have trouble answering. What is the most economical battery per kilowatt? Yeah, um, so look, again, uh, you've got to consider the whole installation, but every time I've done the sums, I do the sums every few months with our battery quotation tool, the best value battery system as a whole is the Tesla Powerwall that we have anyways, because it's so big, you get your 13 and a half kilowatt hours in there, you get one and a half uh, cycles a day if you wire it up right. Um, um, so per kilowatt hour, it's it's best value. Uh, and then also, so you take the rebate money off that as well. And um, there's no added inverter uh, and everything required. And of course, they're only making the one product for the whole of the country. So they've got economies of scale on that. But then they keep putting their prices up and their pricing has gone up four times um, at least in in in, in uh, past few years in response to over demand in response to the south australian battery rebate right so yeah the bigger the battery the better and the more volume the producer is i think the better so david asks he's been told that a tesla powerwall in australia is limited to five kilowatt output and even those made after November 20 are not allowed the seven kilowatt output in Australia. Is this true? Um, I don't know. So you've got, um, I don't know. You've got, you've got uh, inter interface um, power from battery to grid. Uh, but if it's not running from battery to grid, then, then I don't see why it can't put the seven kilowatts out. I was told just recently that it can do seven kilowatts and then that's not to the grid though that's to the internal appliances so if you've got uh, a couple of air cons loaded up at, at two and a half kilowatts each um at, the, at this point in time i don't see any reason why it can't output the seven directly from your home to your appliances 
He's adding that he was told that it was software limited in Australia. Um, yeah, well, I spoke to James, who runs Tesla, uh, our branch anyway, very, very recently, and we're talking about the seven kilowatts. So I, have, I just <clears throat> haven't heard anything otherwise, so I don't know. Right. Looking at the cost of batteries, it occurs to me how easy they would be to steal as it's sitting outside your home. Yeah, well, they're bolted down pretty heavily. They weigh 130 kilograms, and so that wouldn't be easy to steal. Um, and every single thing done through bodies like Solar Victoria, for example, are all um, they are all uh, serial number registered for the uh, all, all those bodies take the serial numbers, and so that I think then what happens then is that leads to there being no market whatsoever for a stolen one because it can't get put in legally. And so uh, then leading from that, I've never heard of one getting stolen at all, not even once. Vandalised in theory, but I have, still haven't heard of it. Um, so the answer is no there, Jackie, I don't think that's a risk. And Hunter's asking in Victoria, is there only one rebate available either for solar cells or for a battery? Uh, that is correct. So Solar Victoria hand out the money and there's no dip, double dipping allowed with Solar Victoria. So it's either the solar or the battery, uh, but the battery is worth more than twice as much as the solar rebate. So if you're thinking about batteries, get the battery rebate instead. Um, will a Tesla power wall support an induction cooktop in a power failure? Um, uh, well, it's all going to come down to the model. Um, so uh, induction cooktops have uh, four, maybe five, maybe six elements in them. And all of them on at once will be too much for that. And some of them are three phase. Uh, so you can get quite small ones as well. Like the Ikea ones, I think are pretty small. And there's ones down at Aldi, you can get two. I am not um, um, completely on top of that answer. So the specifications will speak um, for themselves there to try and see what the uh, kilowatt um, input on that induction cooker is and figure that out. And then you'll have to trick an electrician into wiring it up for you and um, allow you to be discretionary with how many knobs you, you turn on at once. Lindsay asks, if my northwest facing roof is full, is it worth putting more solar on the southeast side? Yep, so southeast should have a loss relative to perfect north of about 25% from memory. And loss is always a funny word because it's not really a loss. It just works 25% uh, less well than north. Um, so that's the factor that you take in. So given that solar panels now are um, half as much money as they were five years ago, probably when you had yours on, you may well find that the southeast is a better value spot given the pricing at the moment than the Northwest was when you did it. So um, look at the figures and factor in roughly a 25 to 30% um, lack of production on that. And, and I would say that uh, possibly it is. You look at a lot of the commercial installs these days and they're filling up every single roof space across the whole building, even facing south. So people have done the sums and south is working pretty well. He's followed that off by saying if he gets more panels, should he move his old panels to the southeast and put the new ones on the northwest? Yeah, moving panels costs a fortune. So every time you move it, you lose um, a couple of hundred dollars per panel in moving it. So it's bound to be worse value. So my feeling would be leave things in place as they are and just put some panels on your southeast face. And Quentin's asking, are free phase batteries available? I have 20 kilowatts of panels. The answer is absolutely. And again, uh, or to reiterate what I've been talking about, it's nothing to do with the battery at all. It's to do with the inverter system you've got. Yes, there are true three phase units around. I know the red back battery system has a true three phase system available. So um, the batteries of course don't exist in phases, they're all in DC, uh, but it's a three phase output interface. And so have a look at that. Um, Redback uh, Technologies 
uh, you can Google that. It's called the three phase uh, smart hybrid battery system. So the answer is yes. Now it's gone nine o'clock. Paul, do you want to call it a day or you want to keep um, going? Well, just pick out the clear, pick out the really clear uh, solar battery ones. I'm very happy to stay and answer all of those. If there's um, ATA sort of induction cooked up ones, I'm not the person to um, know any more about that answer than um, any of the other uh, energy uh, professionals uh, in the meeting. Uh, and this one from Lindsay is easy to reply to. Is something is not on the backup circuit, does it always draw from the mains? Um, no, the backup circuit's only applicable when there's an when there's an outage. So if it's if there's no outage, it's all still integrated, and it will draw off the battery when the grid's up and running. So you get full benefit of self-use um, when when everything's connected. And Peter's asking, and this has come up a few times. Are there fire issues still regarding LG batteries? Um, I'm going to not not really comment. We haven't sold a great amount of LG in the past few years, and the main reason is that they were just a battery on its own, without a huge amount of integration that we saw with other inverter products. And so we found that they had communication. Um, I'm not going to say issues. It just had they had just had um, uh, peculiarities um, with the fact that they were just a battery on its own. Uh, and so we decided that, that they weren't they weren't something that we wanted to sell too many of, and I, I don't know I don't know at all about the fire issues, and I I I'm not I don't know of of those being issues at all at this point. Sorry, the questions have jumped back out of my screen. So it's up. charging storage priorities. If you're waiting for a power outage, you would use less for everyday use. Well, you'd use less of your battery. Yes, that would be true. But power outages are pretty rare, aren't they? Well, completely true. So most, most of the battery manufacturers have manual override control in some way. I know that the Tesla very specifically has or had a, um, a reserve button. You just get the app up on your phone, press that like crazy, and it switches the whole mode of operation from self-use to uh, backup, and then it saves up 100% of its storage and holds on to that um, for as long as you ask it to if you're expecting bad weather. Um, some systems try and do that automatically by predicting bad weather or sending you notifications about that. But at the very least, you know, if you if you hear that there's a storm coming like there has, I think twice in the past two or three weeks here in Victoria, um, yeah, you just you grab your app, press that button, and it changes the whole mode of its operation and you get full backup potential and it will work in that way until you tell it to stop. So you're therefore effectively using the grid to charge your battery up? Um, well, it might take one cycle of free charge, but yeah, of course, you'll, you, yep, it, yep, that's right. You, you yep. charge it with the grid, you pay it a few cents for that to get that done, or a dollar, and then you're running the um, system as a backup unit only. Um, with existing solar panels, can you re retrofit optimizers? 100% uh, of course. Uh, it just costs money, uh, depending on how it's installed, because you may have to pull the panels off and put them back on again, which is which is hard. If you have a tilt frame job, it might be easier just to get your the installer under there and put them on. But yeah, you just unplug it all, plug it all back in again, and add optimizers to the panels. Optimizers, by definition, uh, are 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 supposed to be uh, panel agnostic, so it shouldn't really matter anything about the brand or wattage or voltage of those panels. You just grab an optimizer that suits it and pop it on. The economics would be fairly questionable, I would have thought. I have um, tried many times to make an upselling opportunity out of it. 
and failed each time because it doesn't stack up. So you're putting them on to add your maximum uh, 8% performance to your array, but you're paying sometimes a full um, deinstall plus reinstall as far as labor. And then you're adding the optimizers on and I've never had anyone take up take up that as a, as a concept. Right, I currently have a small 1.75 kilowatt system with premium fit, clearly not useful for a battery. Would I really need to replace the entire system? Um, no, you just get an, an AC battery and you add the AC battery to that system and and be done with it, right? So 1.75 kilowatts should produce, uh, what, say five uh, kilowatt hours a day. Um, so you can choose a small AC battery, maybe the seven kilowatt hour one, and you'll get a lot of that then charged for free. And um, just do that or across your fingers that in uh, two years time, they've invented smaller AC batteries. But no, Rosalie, just leave what you've got there. Um, cross your fingers for smaller AC batteries to come out and, and do that um, when they become available. And it, doing anything wouldn't put at risk her premium, right? Because she's probably getting 67 cents or something until... Yeah, it's, a, it's always been a peculiar question. Um, putting, putting a battery on is, is very definitely uh, cutting off your nose to spite your face. You're, 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 you're putting less to the grid so that you can... Uh, hold on to more of it. So I'm presuming though that Rosalie's question was more technical uh, as far as the size of the system. So she should just leave things as they are until 2024 and then add on an AC battery that's um, small. And a lot more panels probably at the same time. Uh, yeah, well, that's a full conversion then because she's chosen a, a system that was um, uh, may, may be seen as big 10 years ago, but is now uh, a third of our average size. That's right. Peter asks, I'll have maybe one more question after this. Is it likely that solid state battery technology will form part of the residential market? Um, someone might need to tell me what that means. Do they mean capacitors? Do they mean super? super capacitors um, um, but either way I do not have the answer to that question I just don't know so so again my belief is that when a, a technology comes out of nowhere it, it literally does because it, it takes the market by storm and and to come out of nowhere it has to be you can imagine it has to be twice as good and twice as good value and, and those things don't creep up out of nowhere they yeah they, they they're generally is in they don't creep up slowly they tend to just like pop up in my experience and so I, I don't know the answer to that question i think we could keep on going for a long time so maybe we should just call it a day there uh, and if there are some important questions people have asked we'll maybe try and answer those offline uh, from members of the group here Sure, that's completely fine. So um, again, thank you everybody for having me along. Thank you for your patience. Hopefully the um, presentation was um, suitable. Any further questions from me or for me, um, send them through to the conveners of the, um, the chat. And um, I'm very happy to answer any, anything else at all, um, either in person or via email over the next few days, just get in touch with me and um be good to hear from you great well thank you that was wonderful it's so informative good well thank and, you robin uh, thank you and for the uh, other everyone at the 100 people you. all clapping you here and 